It's that time. Let's unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle, and let's get into exploring the wine glass. Hey, everyone. Thanks for joining me on another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Today, I am taking you, thanks once again to the Paso Wine Alliance and Chris Toronto, on a virtual vi visit of distilleries in Paso Robles. Everyone knows that Paso makes exceptional wine, but we also make amazing craft beer and now a growing number of distilleries producing incredible spirits. Join me as I learn about the distilling process from the pros. Aaron Berg of Calwise Spirits, Alex Vilkan of Refined Spirits, and Max Udson of Bethel Road Distillery. I love teaching people the process of tasting wine, but that is not how you want to approach tasting spirits. I'll let them share the proper way, as well as how they incorporate using the outstanding fruit from Paso to make quality spirits. And finally, we get the answer to the age-old question of why is wine and beer a percentage in terms of ABV, yet spirits are talked about in proof. As you are listening, please take a moment to leave a review of the podcast. Words can't describe how appreciative I am of all of you who have done so far. But I could always use more. The more I get, the more that dang algorithm will suggest me to new listeners. So you know it. It's time. Unscrew, uncork, or saber a bottle. And let's learn about spirits. Thanks for listening to Exploring the Wine Glass podcast, the podcast for people who love wine. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Welcome back to Exploring the Wine Glass podcast, the podcast for people who love wine and want to explore it more. I'm Lori Budd, a UC Davis winemaking program, someday service, and WSET Level 2 graduate. You can find Exploring the Wine Glass on all of the socials, as well as your favorite podcast catchers. Thank you to everyone who has given us a review. Leaving a review on iTunes or the purple icon or whatever the heck it's called will drive us up the charts and allow more wine lovers to find us. If you haven't subscribed yet, now is the perfect time. I promise I'll never tell you what to drink, but I'll always share what's in my glass. Hey, everyone. Thank you again for joining us. This is the next installment of the Paso Wine uh, Zoom Hangout, and uh, you're all hanging out with me again. Thank you so much for doing that. Uh, today we are we're, we're doing the distillery show. Uh, not sure if you all know this, but uh, Paso not only is so popular when it comes to our wines and, and great wines that we have here, but we are also have a distillery movement happening. And uh, we're going to get into how that came about and, and, and all uh, in just a minute here. But first, I want to introduce my guests uh, this time around and give them just a second to say hello and say a little bit about uh, who they are and their brand. I'm going to start with Aaron uh, with Calwise. Aaron, hey. Hi there. I'm Aaron Berg with Calwise Spirits Company, and uh, we're located over on Ramada Drive, kind of on the border of Templeton and, and Paso. Uh, we've been here for about two years. We make gin, rum, a range of liqueurs, brandy, uh, whiskey, a little bit of everything. And uh, we're all about making spirits that uh, really glorify uh, the ingredients that are grown here on the Central Coast. Thank you. Happy that you're uh, joining us. Uh, and uh, Alex, uh, you're up next. Hey, I'm Alex Villagana. Um, gosh, actually, yesterday I started my 30th harvest uh, in Paso Robles, so I'm a winemaker as well as a distiller. I actually started my first day of harvest aboard one of Max's family's uh, bottling trucks, uh, working at the old Creston Winery uh, on the east side of Paso Robles. Um, we've actually had our own wine brand uh, since 1993, um, basically renting space uh, from another local winery. Uh, built our own facility uh, in 2001. Uh, and opened up our craft distillery in 2011, so coming on 10 years here. Um, we actually started the distillery to be a little bit more sustainable uh, in our winemaking practices. Uh, we always thought the distillery was just going to be a little distillery nestled in a winery, 
and it turns out our winery is now a small winery basically nestled inside of the distillery. So anyway, we have a good time. We produce a lot of great base spirits, but we also work with some of our local uh, fantastic brewers uh, making base for whiskey. Um, and so we do some grain products as well. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for joining us. And Max Hudson with Bethel Road. Max, um, <clears throat> over here at Bethel Road Distillery. So we started kind of Bethel Road as an offshoot brand. Initially, we wanted to make some grappa. My dad pulled the DSP in 99, I think, to maybe create some spirits one day. And that kind of, uh, you know, all the other projects we had going on. It was a slow burn, and eventually, 2012, we got our still. Realized pretty quick that we were going to make a lot more than just grappa, um, and also that it wouldn't be under the Castoro name. So we started exploring a space to make our spirits and basically utilize all the awesome SIP certified and CCO uh, organic certified vineyards that Castoro already has to make some grappa, but also some killer aged brandies, some gins, some liqueurs, but all from a grape base and the state grown fruit. And so Bethel Road was born in about 2012, and we finally got a space here on Bethel Road, across from Castor Sellers Tasting Room, where we have a distillery, but also a winery. So we make our own wines here in small lots um, from the Castoro fruit. We specialize with the Whale Rock Vineyard, um, and we have kind of have a tasting room for both sides here, kind of like Alex, Alex was saying, we have a distillery nestled within the winery, and definitely um, a lot of cool products come out of that. Yeah, right on. And so I think for our audience sake, uh, I think you're, you're kind of seeing where this is going in that um, much of the distilling uh, process that started in our area, this whole movement, uh, was basically born uh, through wine and through the fact that they're taking uh, a wine product or a grape-based product uh, and fermenting it further or distilling it, I should say. I'm sorry, so it starts fermented, but distilling it down to become these grape-based spirits. And then we've also, of course, uh, moved on from there with uh, other products. How did this come about? It was... Um, I mean, I don't want to put the entire like thing on Alex's shoulders, but uh, a lot of it really had to do with Alex with one day taking Sanye, and if you know what that is, that's basically like the lead-off uh, juice, if you will, of of wine uh, that helps what's left on skins concentrate a little bit more and get a little bit more color in the light. Taking that, that maybe could turn be turned into rosé, or maybe just pour down the drain saving that and distilling that product and Alex I, you know let's go back get back to you what what gave you that vision to start doing that where did this all come from uh, and uh, also how did you convince people to give you all of that Sanye to start <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, 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 the idea really sprung from a want to be a little bit more sustainable. We have a small winery, we produced a couple thousand cases. Um, everything was through our club and through our tasting room. Um, we originally started uh, when we started making wine with some of the Bordeaux varieties. Um, and the process of leading juice off, basically what you're doing is you're pulling free-run juice off right after you bring the grapes into the, into the winery. And what you're doing is you're just trying to change the ratio of juice to skins in the ultimate fermentation. Um, and so uh, it's most common, I would say, in uh, Rhone varieties. And so uh, I was actually late to the game on Rhone varieties. I think our first uh, year probably was about 95. We started producing some, uh, some Syrah and Grenache. And um, one of my uh, uh, fellow winemakers, uh, Eric Jensen from Booker Vineyards, um, told me about the process of bleeding. I was kind of like, well, why do you do that? And he explained it. And what do you do with the juice? Um, it all went down the drain, unfortunately. And started doing it with my own wines and saw the quality that it really imparted on the wines that we produced. Um, and so I started doing the same thing. And, you know, you, you try to make rosé out of it. But, it, you know, when you're picking red wine grapes, the sugars are a lot higher. They ask a lot lower. And it doesn't make a good rosé unless you manipulate it. So, you know, it's just kind of you, you grin and bear it. And, uh, and so trying to figure out all these years what to do with it. And um, when I actually stumbled across Ciroc Vodka, that was a great base product the light bulb went off and I was like, well, I thought vodka was produced from potatoes. Um, and so uh, we tried to figure out, you know, could we legally actually put a, a distillery inside of a winery? Um, and so it took us about two years to jump through all the hoops. And um, we finally got the approval uh, to basically become a distillery within a winery. And we started collecting that juice in 2011 when we first got our license. 
Um, that's our current spill that you see in the picture. This oh, is a part of the current one. Sorry. That okay. one. That's right. Um, so we are actually on our fourth still now. Um, so that's our newest stripping still. It's a, it's a 750 liter Bavarian Holstein still. Um, uh, and so that's actually still number three. Um, <laughs> that's the original guy that started the girl. So this was actually, it's a, a 60 gallon still. And, um, and to give you perspective, that huge that winemakers pulled off, and I collect it from probably about 20 different winemakers here in the area. Um, by the third year, I was collecting close to 25,000 gallons of the juice that was getting poured down the drain. It was going from you know, some of the top wineries in the area, um, you know, the Bookshire and Saxons and Lenny Colotos, and so really top-notch juice. And, um, uh, and so anyway, it was a way for us to collect something that was getting wasted and thrown down the drain. And, you know, they're now getting paid for something that was actually being a waste product. And actually, one of the, uh, one of the winemakers uh, up at Dow, uh, Daniel, he basically offered to pay me to take it away, but not a good businessman. I actually paid him to do it. I should, I should have been smart and just taken the money. So anyway, that's, that's how we got kind of the start with this thing, is wanting to be more sustainable uh, and use a product that was being wasted. And then what we found is the consumers loved it. And um, I, I'm sure Max and Aaron probably saw the same thing as soon as they opened their doors. It's like all of a sudden it's like, how do you keep up? Because the stills are the certain size. It's just, you just got half there running all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And, and actually I'll, I'll go to Aaron next. Um, you, your, your inspiration uh, for becoming a distiller actually started in an interesting way. I mean, I think there were, but you started in college as well, didn't you? I did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that, that comes with an interesting story, actually, and I, I hope you share that, but also share a little bit of your inspiration of what brought you to Paso to be able to open up your distillery. Yeah, so I was born and raised down in Southern California, down in Ventura County, and came up to Cal Poly to go to college, like a, a lot of, a lot of uh, folk stories start out. I came to Cal Poly, went to college there, studied agriculture, crop science, uh, minor wine and viticulture, and I also had a little moonshine still that I, I kept, and it's just you know home distilling. Uh, I, I I was doing it when I was living in the dorms, and you know I, I got caught and uh, kicked out, uh, which was an interesting experience. But uh, you know kept doing it, moved off campus, kept doing it just as a hobby, um, and I never intended to make it a business or, or anything. I, I just thought it was going to be a fun hobby and I was going to go into ag and become a, a farm or, or a vineyard manager. And uh, then I, I started realizing, like, I, I don't know if I want to be a farm or a vineyard manager. And, and I'm really digging this whole hobby distilling thing and, and, and noticing that, hey, this is where, this is kind of where, where, the, where the market's going. People are, are, are interested in, in small batch craft spirits and I can potentially make a business out of this. Uh, so, I did. So you distilled in college. I actually made wine <laughs> yeah. in, the, in the bathtub in my apartment. Yeah, yeah I, I took a, I, I got like a little, you know, two gallon pressure cooker and you know, kind of jerry rigged that and uh, made some pretty, some pretty nasty stuff in the beginning, of course. But uh, so was my wine. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how it turns out, and. Uh, I, I think what really appeals to me about distilling is that I, my whole life I've always had this conflict in me between going into a profession that is more artistry and one that is more uh, you know, scientific. And I found that distilling is this really happy medium and happy balance that allows me to both be an artist and a scientist. Totally. Cool. Right on. Uh, getting a little background next uh, with Max Hudson with Bethel Road Distillery. Max, you come from a family of basically vintners in, in essence. And was this kind of your you know, distillery idea, your injection into the family business uh, it, it, and how it kind of came about? No, I can't take credit for um, coming up with the idea for doing you know, some distillation. My dad comes down to him traveling in Italy um, back in his earlier days. When he was 18, he lived in Italy for a year and drank a lot of grappas um, and just kind of saw a lot of the Italian ways where there was a, you know, a winery but always a small distillery nearby. Um, in Italy, you can't really get rid of your pumice. Legally, you have to track it um, and 
until it gets to a distiller because they're making grappa from it. And you have to just as much as you record your, um, you know, your gallons of alcohol produced in a winery or in a distillery, you had to keep record of your pumice because if you were discarding your pumice, they were assuming you're making spirits from it, um, which is a pretty funny thing because here our pumice is just, you know, discarded, tossed, you know, either for fertilizer or for cattle feed or, you know, a variety of different things. So my dad had saw that, and he always wanted to make grapple one day. It was kind of the, the idea. And that was what I was mentioning earlier. He got, a, got the DSP way back in intention to do that, but the still didn't end up coming in until I think the harvest of 2011 had arrived. Um, and we have a 300-liter um, Arnold Holstein uh, still as well. And I think, Alex, you have a Holstein? Yeah, I got a 750. 750, yeah. So um, that was what we, we got as a good hybrid still that we could produce, you know, grappas and very, you know, aromatic, brandy kind of uh, spirits. And so it was kind of, that was the, the, the idea was let's make some grappas. But where I came in was, um, well, who's going to run this still and how is it going to, what are we going to make? And so, um, you know, coming into that, I think I brought in the attitude of like, hey, there's a lot of awesome craft spirits being produced these days and there's a resurgence or, and, a, you know, Surgeons of craft movement, uh, especially in the spirits department. So why why can't we make more than just grappas? And so after getting kind of a crash course on the still and um, and running it with our, our longtime previous um, winery manager who was kind of retiring around that time, um, I learned a couple you know did a couple runs with him and then was was kind of cut loose with the still. And that was when I you know. The more I learned, the more I wanted to make and create. And knowing what we could create from a great base, it's not just, you know, brandies or grappa. There's a ton of other you know, spirits that you can, you know, even liqueurs you can use a great base from or a gin. Um, and kind of that interest sparked Bethel Road Distillery rather than it being a subcategory of Castor Cellars and a grappa label. It was like, hey, this is, needs to be its own business and it needs to be its own identity. And um, I was excited to kind of breathe life into that and um, be able to create a bunch of different products from from this great base because we have a plethora of vineyards that are you know organic certified here in, in uh, the Central Coast and why not utilize those vineyards also the pumice which is a byproduct um, after you've made your wine so we're kind of um, just you know highlighting the awesome fruit we already grow and. I'm able to make some killer spirits. I am curious as to for you guys, it's not just the three of you, but it's a lot more in our area. And so you guys have, have somehow organized a distiller distillers club or a distillers association. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm cheapening it and that's horrible. <laughs> um, who's, who's in charge of that thing and, and how many people you got involved in this thing? Yeah. So, Max, did you want to say it? Well, I was going to say it's growing all the time, but I do remember at one point uh, calling you when I was in the, uh, I think we were, I was at the winery at the time, our still was out at Castoro Cellars, and I was chatting with my dad, and he was like, you know, back in the day, we, we formed, uh, you know, basically the PRWCA just by banding together. He's like, maybe we should give Alex a call and see what they're up to. So, it was kind of like, let's lift up the hood and see what other people are doing, and I remember those early days before the trail existed, we just kind of connected. It was like, yeah, we should we should form some sort of group here. Um, yeah. No, I, I that, that's exactly, you know, I think it was you and then uh, Lola um, uh, and Steve from Pendres. And, I, you know, the cool thing about it, actually uh, our region, and it's, we're actually the distillers of Slow County. So we're, we're basically, we encompass all of Slow. Um, and it, the because I think a lot of us early on were members of the wine industry, we saw how successful the PRWCA, the, the Wine Alliance, was for the wineries here in this area. And so everybody wanted to jump on board. And, you know, it, it's cool. I do a lot of this stuff in the, uh, the state of California. And it's amazing. All the other distillers from the other regions of California look at Paso Robles as almost a model of how distillers are actually supposed to work together. We're probably one of the most organized, but also we're willing to pitch in because it's that old, you know, the rising tide raises all boats. And, you know, when, when Paso was 20 wineries, nobody knew about us. So people had to basically band together to get the story out there. And, uh, you know, the cool thing is most of the distillers in the area um, are thinking the same thing. And I think we have about 12 people on the trail. Is that right, guys? I think at this point, 12, yeah. Yeah, I, I was just saying, yeah, 12. If not, I think there might even be 14, Pau, but, uh, yeah. 
Yeah, and there's a couple I think that haven't joined yet that are distillers, but I think they're just kind of getting started. They're small. Um, you know, like Santa Maria Brewing has a, a still that's uh, going to be up and running. I don't know if it's actually running yet. Um, the uh, chef Eric from uh, uh, Allegretto, he's starting a distillery and is uh, slowly kind of getting involved. And um, and so it's they're popping up a lot. And, uh, a lot of it is you know the the, the laws have changed. People are actually now. Um, it's just like the farm to table movement with anything. You know, people want to know where their their food comes from, their wine comes from, um, and now people are learning that you know it's the same thing with spirits. Um, you know, they want to know you know who made it, who is behind it, how it was aged. Um, you know, the different styles, and um, you know, we we were talking earlier, so we actually have some cool spirits today. And a lot of people get into the spirits business by spirits that somebody else made, um, and you're not going to get a lot of variation from something like that. Um, and on each one of these labels, it basically says distilled by it. So the three of us that you're looking at are the ones who actually did the distillation um, and put it in bottle. We didn't let somebody else do the distillation and just slap a fancy label on it. And, um, and I think that's the cool thing about our region, too, is a lot of us. Yeah, you can, you can see it back there. And, and it's um, and so all of our spirits are very distinct. And I think you're really going to see that in today's line. Alex, I think one of the things about the trail forming and you're talking about Paso being a model for other like distillery regions in California, I think in the nation too, is that when I have a question, I text Aaron, you know, hey, what'd you do here? Or, you know, I don't know what I'm doing on this thing. I'll call Alex and say, hey man, I ran into this issue. Uh, what'd you do? And having that connection really is great for the distillers to, you know, have a, you know, a wide variety of knowledge, but it makes our products better in the end. So the consumers, by us having this group that's really close knit and able to connect, we end up making better products. And so that kind of community of distillers in this area really ended up getting in the final product. Yeah. No, it's, it's true. And, uh, that, you know, I think the distilling industry as a whole is like super competitive and secretive. And, you know, when I got into winemaking, I basically was kind of self-taught. Um, and, and so I made a lot of mistakes. And the cool thing with the winemakers in the area is you can call them and say, okay, I did this. How do I get out of this mess? And, uh, and so I think we've, we've kind of grown up with, with that kind of attitude is, you know, we got we got to help each other. And, uh, and, you know, distilling is, you know, because it's still illegal to do on a home scale other than Aaron and cow wise. Um, essential oils. I heard Aaron essential oils. Exactly. Um, anyway, it's, uh, it's good that we have this uh, community that we can reach out to. Yeah. Um, let's get to tasting, uh, some of this stuff and also talking a little bit more about the nuance of what makes whiskey whiskey and, and, and the differences from, say, wheat whiskey versus uh, other things that might be making whiskey and the brandy and the gin and all that good stuff. Um, I'd like to start, though, with you, Alex, because I think this is our tasting order. Okay. We'll go with uh, the refined wheat whiskey, uh, then we'll go with the American brandy from Bethel Road, and then we'll finish up with the Big Sur gin. One question I have now. Okay, whiskey goes into cocktails, and whiskey, I mean, whiskey can be had in so many different ways. But when a person walks into your tasting room, and you're having, and, I'm, and this is a question for all three of you, are, in wine, you get a two-ounce pour, and you're told to swirl and sniff, and all. Is there a process by which you are tasting, say, your spirits? Is there a a special glass, like what are what are we looking at, um, and and how is that process when they come into your tasting rooms? Yeah, no, it's it is actually it was interesting. Uh, you know, the first time we actually had um, people come into our tasting room, and consumers weren't used to going into distillery tasting rooms at that point. Um, we do have special little small tasting glasses. Um, you do swirl it uh, just to kind of release the flavors. You do smell it. You taste it. The, the big difference on the spirits, you don't need a lot. We only are actually legally allowed a half ounce, or excuse me, an ounce and a half of all the spirits total. And so usually, you know, we pour a quarter ounce of spirit, but because spirits are so magnified and they coat your palate so much, you don't need much more than that to really taste it. Um, another big difference is when you're tasting spirits, you don't want to basically like breathe across your palate like you would with wine, because all you're going to do is basically throw that alcohol down in your throat, and it really almost it, it kind of destroys the, the tasting experience. So it's it's really just kind of letting it hit your palate, and then almost on the, on the exhale, um, you can actually get a lot of those aromas coming back through your mouth and through your nose. Um, so it is it is interesting to have people try the spirits and you know when people first came in you could tell they were bracing like they're going to take a shot of vodka at the bar and they try it and you can see their body just physically relaxed 
And part of it is when you're tasting crafted spirits, we, you know, we serve them at room temperature um, without anything to chase it with. And what people find is, um, especially the grape based spirits, they're so soft and easy to drink um, that you know they can sip it, and it basically has this beautiful experience. Um, and you can try something that is very unique. And uh, you know, like our regular vodka, you know, you line it up with ten different vodkas, and you're going to pick it out every time. Um, the one I brought today, and even though we're, you know, we were based in kind of started with grape based spirits and saving that juice that was getting wasted in the wine industry. Um, as I said earlier, we do work with a, um, actually Firestone Walker, which is one of the best brewers probably in the world. And, uh, and so we're fortunate to have them here in the area. And, and so they basically will produce us a non-hot uh, grain-based beer, um, which is the base for all whiskeys. Um, and uh, the reason why I'm showcasing this one, the Patch Robles Wheat, is it was super exciting. Patch Robles was originally one of the grain areas, uh, biggest grain areas in California. And um, but the grain industry kind of dropped died out because it's you know difficult farming uh, it takes a lot of water um there is actually a local grower um, over on the east side of Paso Robles, Kenny Amy, um and he is actually growing heirloom wheats uh and uh barleys and actually malting them right here in the county so he has a small micro uh, malting facility and um and so he supplies the grain uh firestone walker turns into the beer and then we uh ferment still an age right here on our property um in these small barrels uh to basically produce a, a local terroir um a whiskey um and to add one more little thing to it we actually throw it in a used syrah barrel just add a little bit of that wine complexity in the background so it's it's really kind of whiskey meets wine and you know, we proof it a little bit higher, um, so it's actually it's 52% alcohol, uh, 104 proof, um, and that higher proof for me uh, means one, you can mix it um, if you wanted to, because you can layer in uh, different flavors on top of it. Um, but if you drink it by yourself, I would usually put like a big rock on this, but uh, it, it won't dilute as much if it, you know, a lower proof sometimes can dilute if you do add like an ice cube or something to it. Um, and another reason why we keep the proof high is when it ages in those small barrels like you're sitting on the screen right now, um, it put, picks up a lot of wood proteins. And so if you drop the alcohol down too much, the protein will become unstable in the barrels or in the bottle, um, and it'll basically settle out. And so to, to solve that, a uh, distiller will chill filter, which strips out a lot of that protein. And for me, if you think about protein, it's that mouthfeel, it's the texture. And, you know, it's, uh, filters don't choose between good and bad. They just strip things away. And having a tasting room for our winery right next door, I always say, if I filtered my wine through 12 feet of charcoal, how good could that wine be? And you can see people like sit there and think about it and go, hey, that kind of makes sense. Why do they filter through 12 feet of charcoal? And it's because, it, one, they're trying to get rid of the proteins. And two, sometimes they have bad flavors that they're trying to get rid of, dimethyl sulfide, sulfurous compounds. And, and so for us, it's about starting with really good base ingredients, um, doing our job right all the way through, bottling it unfiltered so that the consumer can really try something unique and special. Really cool. And now I, I feel better about putting an ice cube in my whiskey, so thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> what do you guys think? What do you guys think of this whiskey? Well, now, I'm going to say I, I, like, I like cringed a little bit when I saw it was 52% because I usually like don't like whiskeys that are that high. I, I like my whiskeys definitely in like the mid, like the low to mid 40s range. But uh, this is really smooth for, for how high it is. Like, I tasted it, and it, it, it doesn't taste like it's 52%. It's very smooth. Um, I love the the wheat characteristic, too. I think wheat is a very um, underrated base material to make whiskey from. I mean, everyone's making bourbon. And uh, I, uh, I, frankly, not to, like, rag on it too much, but I think bourbon is, like, the least exciting of all the whiskeys. I, I think uh, wheat whiskey is, is, is very cool. Uh, and, yeah, I've... I'm pretty stoked on, on how this tastes. Thanks. No, it, I, the reason why I went with wheat is when I first actually got started in this whole thing, there wasn't a lot of places to learn about making spirits um, other than the college dorm room. Um, but so I went up to Dry Fly Distilling up in Spokane, Washington, and their basically their idea was to use local products to produce spirits up in the Spokane. And so they were really heavy into the wheat whiskeys. And so I just love that uh, kind of that kind of sweetness on the palate. Um, and so uh, the wheat is actually a main ingredient in most of my grain builds, um, whether it's my bourbon, my rye, or in this case, the wheat with me. Um, I like that wheat because I think it rounds out a spirit really nicely. And, and that's why I think I can get away at that, you know, higher proof is that, that wheat softens it. Yeah, it's, it's like wheat is makes a super soft whiskey. It, it almost kind of gives it this, this like... Uh, like very like, like kind of like fruity like light taste too that that I I love in, in a wheat whiskey. Yeah, no, for sure. Right on. 
Hey, Alex, this is really nice. And I, it's very has a nice uh, toasted malt to it. It's really, really nice. Like like the brown parts of a marshmallow that you just pull off that are the best. You know? Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Isn't it crazy that we have somebody malting right here in Paso? I was going to mention that. I don't know if the viewers or how much people realize how complex that process is and difficult it is to actually have that and have it locally is pretty insane. Talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. The malting process is basically that sprouting of the grain um, and it basically starts to grow, which helps convert the starches over into sugar. And then you have to kill the sprout at a certain time before it gets too big. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't start growing or anything like that. Um, it takes a lot of floor space. A lot of it's done on floor. Uh, temperature control. You got to get the temperature up um, warm enough to kill the, the little new growth on the grain uh, at the right time. And so he's built this kind of cool solar-powered malting facility out there. Oh, wow. But it's really small. I mean, so yeah, this year we probably bought about two to 3,000 pounds of the grain from him uh, that, uh, that Firestone turned into beer for us. Um, but, it, you know, he's learning. We're, we're learning. Um, it's grain that, that Sonora wheat, which was brought to the United States in the 1600s, uh, and then Metcalf barley. Does, the wheat whisk, does this wheat whiskey have barley? I'm sorry. Yeah, a little bit, about 10% uh, barley, uh, but okay. primarily, primarily wheat. Okay. So, and for whiskey, for people that aren't aware, all you have to do is it's, it's basically over 50% of a certain grain to qualify in a more specific category. So bourbon, and it has to be you know 51% corn, uh, rye, same thing with rye, has to be the primary. But then you can have other grains in there as well. A lot of whiskeys have barley. So barley is a great workhorse. That's why probably beer is made from barley. It ferments really well. It's, it, it helps out in the background. And now, a word from our sponsor. Exploring the Wine Glass is brought to you by Dracaena Wines. Dracaena Wines is an artisan winery located in Paso Robles, California. They have been producing wine since 2013. Their first vintage began with one wine, their classic Cabernet Franc, which received a 91 in Wine Enthusiast. Since then, they have increased production, received several accolades, including multiple double gold medals, and a consistent 90-plus rating. Visit their website, www.dracinawines.com, to schedule a private tasting and to see their entire portfolio. Purchase your award-winning wine and let Dracina Wines help turn your moments into great memories. Alex, I wasn't sure if you said it already, but how long was this aged and what type of barrels? Yeah, so it was in uh, 10 gallon um, American oak whiskey barrels, half new, half used bourbon barrels. Um, and that was for the first about a year and a half. And then we finished it for about a year in the Syrah barrel. Um, and it was a mirror use uh, Syrah barrel, which tends to give it a really a kind of a, when they're new, they're super aggressive, kind of toasty, smoky barrels. And I'm wondering if that's kind of where you're picking up some of that marshmallow kind of uh, characteristic. To... And when you put it into a red, I'm sorry, Aaron. No, no worries. Oh. I was going to say, when you put it into a red barrel, do you, do you uh, clean it pretty heavily first? You don't get the red color bleeding into the spirit? You know, we just did a regular kind of pressure wash on it, and I was kind of worried about the same thing. And um, no, it, you could, there was no perceptible uptake of the color, uh, the red wine color. And it's coming out of Syrah. Syrah's got a ton of pigment in it. Um, uh, the interesting thing is when it came out of the whiskey barrels, it was a little coarse and a little rough around the edges. After putting it into the different type of wood, and you know, a high alcohol, even though for wine, most of the oak flavors have been pulled out for wine, when you put a, a spirit in barrel, um, it can pull out more that's still in there because the higher alcohol basically uh, makes those compounds a little bit more soluble. And so it pulls out some of those compounds that wine couldn't pull out. It goes deeper. Yeah. Max. Max, I'd like to move on to uh, the American brandy. Um, I know that there's a story behind calling it that for, for one thing, but also I think you were going to have a, a comment about tasting. So let's talk about how we taste uh, as well. Yeah. Um, so coming from a wine region and being a winery, you know, ourselves, you can sometimes get people that have you know, been tasting a few places already during the day or maybe even taste our wines before doing the spirits tasting and we don't catch them first, you know, and remind them this is spirit and not wine. You know, the reaction that everyone has is you grab a glass, you're holding it, you're just going to like 
swirl it vigorously because you know for wines that's what we we're used to doing it's kind of just second nature because it really does you know add some oxygen and releases the you know the aromas in the wine which is a good thing to be doing with your wines with spirit what that does is pretty much agitates the alcohol and releases the alcohol vapor so you go put your nose back in that glass that you've just vigorously swirled like a wine you're just going to pick up all alcohol vapor so you're just whoa and we've seen that you know too many times so we try to catch everybody before we start the, the tasting just to remind them that this is high proof spirit and not a you know 12 to 15 percent wine this is you know 40 to 50 percent um, alcohol so just do a nice roll you know you can still move it around the glass but you know we tell people to just roll it around so you're just kind of lightly releasing if you do swirl it let it settle before you put your nose into it so the alcohol kind of settles back down and then uh, when you bring it into the palate it isn't really just like a shot like alex would say a lot of people see it and they're like oh this is my shot boom so let's send it back um you know that's one way to do it but if you do want to pick up the flavors to let it roll over your tongue swallow it and then exhale so you don't want to be inhaling while you're you're um, putting it through your mouth because then you'll inhale that alcohol vapor again and probably make you cough You've seen that in the tasting room, I'm sure, as well. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Grab the glass, and I know what they're doing. Just, so uh, that's what we always try to be educational, too, in the tasting room, because we are in a wine region that people are so familiar with, and you know, going through a wine tasting has become you know, pretty normal, but a spirits tasting is a different thing. So we want to bring that education into the experience of the consumer and tell them about our spirits, but also how to enjoy them. You know, some things need also... In cocktails we kind of guide people along the path so people learn about the spirits we're producing and how to consume them while they're in the tasting uh, that's good to know thank you so american brandy is uh what we have uh um 80 proof great label by the way love this label thank you. and uh we got a little picture of your crew there on on the screen as well but talk about this brandy and uh what do we need to know about it yeah, so this brandy, um, kind of a fun one. When, like I was telling you earlier, when we started the distillery, uh, we were talking about doing grappas, but, uh, you know, part of me, I, I do love whiskeys and also um, the flavor profile you get from a bourbon. But since we're not dealing any grain uh, currently at Buffalo Distillery, we have some killer grapes, you know, to pull from, all sorts of different varietals. We've, we've distilled, you know, a handful of different varietals to kind of create our base brandies. Um, this one here, we started with Chenin Blanc, and we pretty much did a, a, like a bourbon age program on this brandy. So we put, we got brand new Char American Oak barrels. So, um, you know, from Char 3 down to Char 1. So, you know, there's different Char levels, and essentially it's, you know, the, the level of toast, but this, in this case, um, Char inside the barrel. So the barrel producer manufacturer is actually creating like an alligator skin of charcoal on the inside as they, they heat it up, um, which caramelizes and does a whole bunch of different things to the oak um, on the interior of the barrel. So typically bourbon gets these barrels um, and has a wonderful history in producing this type of, uh, that type of whiskey with that barrel profile. But I said, why not do that with the brandy? So um, these barrels that we used for the American brandy, we ended up calling it because of the American heritage kind of like, bourbon style brandy um, and we've aged the oldest barrels in this blend are five years old and none younger than three years so you really get a long time in the barrel I think this was a five barrel blend and one of the barrels was three years old the rest are five so you get a lot of age um, spending time in those char barrels you get huge transformation over time uh, things that didn't previously exist um, due to that micro oxidation of a barrel breathing um, and the, basically the, the fuse oil is combined to esterify to create components that didn't exist previous. And um, so the spirit combining with all these things will create some fun, some fun flavor. So this has been one that I've wanted to produce for a long time, kind of eyes on it in the first year of distilling. And this one, uh, going back and visiting the barrels, as Alex and uh, Aaron can attest to, they change all the time. And finally, going back to these barrels and finding them being really settled in and not too clunky or maybe too harsh in certain areas and being able to put a blend together that kind of highlights all these unique characteristics of each barrel. And so we get an American brandy here, um, down to 80 proof, and um, 
kind of some some caramel notes like uh, I was talking about in Alex's, but just a, a pretty fun crossover product that is a great based spirit but a, in these kind of uh, non traditional barrels. Yeah, the caramel, the caramel and vanilla on the nose are just fantastic. So, and you know, you, you taste it on the on the palate, and it's just you know, forty percent alcohol. It's still high alcohol, and it's just super soft and easy to drink. It's absolutely delicious. Uh, I'm curious. So you said it's uh, Shannon that you you as, as part of it. This is almost a question for all of you. You know, to be able to say AVA you have to have 85% of your fruit being from that specific ABA. Are there any rules like that in, in these spirits that you can or cannot say where that base product or that base fermented liquid uh, is coming from, or do you have to, or is that a thing? Hey, I don't know, to be quite honest. Um, the I know on whiskeys it's a grain-based thing. Um, locale hasn't played as big a role, I think, in spirits, but I'm not sure, to be quite honest. Ours says Pastor Rivers wheat whiskey just because the grains were grown here. Um, I don't know if, you know, and it passed through the TTV, so they didn't give me a hard time um, when the, when we put it through. Um, yeah, I don't know. Do either of you guys know? Is there uh, Appalachian-based issues with spirits? No. Oh, yeah. You know, I mean, other than just having to make, you know, bourbon in America and to do that be made in Mexico, I don't, I don't know of any. Yeah. From my experience, it's very much the Wild West in your label uh, nomenclature compared to wine, which is like super specific and tedious and, um, you know, the things you say have to be really double check. For me, it seems like the spirit world is not nearly as focused on um, making sure that regional claims or certain claims besides like uh, type of spirit are really uh, very much monitored. Yeah, I, I guess you get you got uh, you got Malibu rum, right? And that's <laughs> just getting canceled, I think. So, <laughs> um, Eric, uh, before we go to you and the gin, I want to hear your thoughts on this brandy. Mm. Uh, what I really love about uh, Max's brandies, and I've had you know, those other styles of brandy before. Uh, I think that I have the Muscat brandy, if I recall correctly. What I like about the way Max makes his brandy is you can taste the, the grapes and, and fruit in, in the brandy. And and that's what uh, oh, these mass-produced big brand brandies, they just kind of taste like alcohol and oak. They don't have a lot of character to them, but I love how Max brandy, you can taste like the grapes, you can like the muscat brandy. You can taste that it was made from orange muscat, and you know in this American brandy, you can taste the the, the fruit from the grapes that it came from. You know, I, I get a lot of uh, berry and, and, and pear notes. Uh, I almost kind of get this uh, like kind of buttery caramel note in it too, which I really like that you don't usually find in brandy, but I really dig it in this. Hey Max. Uh, because I we toyed around with the idea of actually doing brandies, but uh, one of the first things I was kind of reading about is that you have to have really good acidity in the grapes to make you know quality brandies. And obviously, Paso, we're not known for our acidity on you know, some of our red wines. Um, well, I mean, is that why you picked Shannon for this? Well, yeah. I mean, we what I was doing initially, like very early on, was trying different varietals, distilling them, and seeing what the spirit came out like. You know. Because what my readings, especially, is like if you're going to be in cognac, you're using like Uni Blanc, yeah. and, and you know, these different, you know, like you're saying, um, kind of like low flavorful white wines that have good acid. So, you know, high tannic wines, red wines, or white aren't going to be producing great spirits, is what, you know, the kind of the readings say. Um, so, trying them out and finding out like what actually comes out of the still when you do distill these things. So, Chenin Blanc early was one that showed a lot of promise of like kind of really clean spirit that had still some fruit coming through. But, um, you know, we've, we've toyed around with Pinot Grigio even, um, um, obviously Viognier, um, Chenin Blanc we have a good supply of, and it's a spirit that I find distills really well. Um, and probably for some of those reasons, I think. And, yeah, I think more than anything, just toying with things and never – never pretending like you know what you're doing because the more you 
you do, the more you learn, you know, and always being a, like a student to the, to the distilling game is kind of where I try to put myself and not pretend like I know exactly what I'm trying to produce until I do it and, and see the outcome. Yeah, Brandy's kind of, kind of an interesting beast I found where I've I've gotten like like Grenache for instance. I, I, I got a batch of Grenache that I distilled and it made some beautiful brandy. Um, and then I got another batch of Grenache distilled it the same way, but it was you know from a different winemaker, different appellation, and it it did not come out good. Um, I've had like some some Zin that I've distilled that's made some really beautiful brandy. I've had most other Zins don't make good brandy. So it's been it's been kind of a weird thing that I've been trying to, to figure out and, and crack. But I found the same thing with the white bridles. Like I made a, a, a beautiful brandy from uh, Grenache Blanc actually. I made an awesome brandy. I've made an awesome brandy from uh, Riesling before too. So uh, yeah, it was kind of, kind of an interesting thing how some varieties work and some don't. Yeah, Grenache Blanc yeah. is what we use as well. Yeah. Yeah, that, Where that did the Moscato come from for for the grappa? Um, that's from our vineyard. I think it's Jackknife Vineyard on by, oh. by, by the winemaking facility. But that's just a classic variety to distill and for grappas especially because it is so aromatic. It is so, um, I guess, telling the, the flavors there. So it's really expressive when you distill that. It comes through super obviously. Um, Let's get into the gin. Um, so, Aaron, when people come in, once again, are you pouring it straight? You stick in an ice cube? What are you doing? And how are how are you serving? Are you serving it serving it at a certain temperature? What's up? Yeah, so we're we're just you know we're pouring all of our spirits at a group temp, and uh, people are just tasting them like that. We also, I mean, uh, pre pre pandemic, we had a craft cocktail bar so you could come in and get it in a cocktail too um, we don't have that anymore but we are because we are a restaurant we are doing cocktails to go so people can like get it and get it to go if they want in a cocktail um, but most people are coming in uh, just to taste it straight and, and, and they just want to taste it and experience the different flavors that are in it and i've noticed this this interesting uh thing about the gin drinker is that they they tend to be like your like IPA beer drinkers in a way because um, IPA beer drinkers like they love that like really you know in your face herbaceous flavor and, and gin is, is kind of uh, similar and and uh, you know different IPAs taste different depending on what kind of hops are, are put in it gin is the same way you know you got really light gins really bold gins really floral gins really juniper gins really earthy gins and uh, I, I found that's the kind of person who who likes gin. Uh, a lot of women like gin too. Uh, my clientele is actually about 60% women, 40 men, um, which which was kind of an interesting thing that that I found. Uh, our gin is just really light and floral too, uh, which uh, you know a lot of uh, the more modern gins tend to be on, on the more light floral side. Um, they're just kind of getting away from like that bitter juniper, like Christmas tree being shoved down your throat experience. <laughs> What's the base alcohol on this, Aaron? Sorry? What's your base alcohol? Is it grain? No, no, no. It's, it's grapes. So it's grape. Kind of like, you know, what you make your gin from. Uh, Max, you make yours from grape too, I believe. Um, yeah, we, we, we use grapes. Um, it's kind of whatever I can get, you know, any, any wine that have some sonye, extra grapes, even even you know already fermented wine, I'll take it and I make it into the base for the gin. Uh, I use that as a base for my. I make some liqueurs too. Um, we make rum, so obviously we don't use grapes for that. We use molasses. The whiskey we use grain, but we do we do use grapes for a lot of our other spirits. I, th- I find it makes a, a really uh, great base. Uh, you call this classic Big Sur gin and. I'm not kidding here. I feel like I smell Big Sur in the glass. I don't think we the way it's smelling now, honestly, because we published giant fire over there. It's really sad. Good. But I mean, like you're hiking in Big Sur and you're getting these sage smells and uh, these earthy smells and and these crisp smells, almost like saline as well. I mean, it's it, it has a lot going on in the nose. I like that. Yeah. Bay too. What's what's that? I like that bay in there. That bay leaf. Oh yeah. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's you know, I, I kind of looked at at like successful distilleries and you know what what makes a spirit truly unique. And you look at you know Scotch, and Scotch is unique because it's made with the, they smoke the grain with the peat because there's a lot of peat growing in Scotland. You know, tequila they, is made from agave, which is a it's, it's a plentiful crop in, in Mexico. And I thought, you know, what can I do? with my my gin to make it unique to the central coast and make like a truly unique california gin so you know we got big sur right up the road here one of my favorite places in the world uh, so we put native plants that grow in big sur like white sage and elderberry and, and bay leaves so you really like taste that experience and i have a lot of customers that you know they come down here on their way from big sur they were just having big sur for the weekend they'll come down on sunday on their way back home they'll say no, I, I want to take that experience home in a bottle, and that's that's really cool. That's cool. I don't know about you guys, but as a winemaker first, actually making gin, I think, was one of the most fun experiences uh, because you were able to fine-tune kind of a blend, and it's, it's very much like blending different wine varieties together in a sense, um, but you can actually really kind of fine-tune, you know, whether it's that sage or bay or whatever you're putting into it and, and really dial in those flavor compounds. And I like that you didn't use too many where, you know, you get some of these gins that has like 40 different botanicals. You can't tell one from the other. And so I like that you basically, you are really tight on the botanicals and, and, and you can really pick them up as you taste this gin. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, have, we have 12 different botanicals in there. I tried to, yeah, tried to like tiptoe this line of being complex but not too crazy. Yeah. And, and I totally agree with you. I think that gin is not my favorite spirit to drink, but it's my favorite spirit to make. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, I was curious. I wanted to bring up the, the creation of a gin because for me, that was a couple year process of tinkering. And it was kind of like potential paralysis because there's so much you can do and there's so many areas to pull from. And if I soak this for this long or if I use this crushed compared to whole, if I, you know, you know, do all these different things, you get a different outcome. And so it was like, it's really exciting, but it was daunting and like finding your way through it. And then coming back to, I think what Aaron was saying is like, knowing what you want to create in the, as a final product is like honing, honing you in to be able to do it. That's what I ended up doing, but it was a process. Yeah. And even where to put those botanicals in your still. I'm, I, I was having a real hard time originally getting a lot of the juniper flavor out when you actually did the vapor pass, actually having the vapor pass through it. Um, and it, because we had this still that actually had the, uh, uh, the uh, basically the botanical basket on top of the still, and I was fortunate enough, one of the uh, distillers from St. George Spirit, which is kind of like, they're, they're one of the earliest craft distillers in the United States. He came down and actually told me what their trick was. And they actually, if you look behind um, Max's shoulder and see those windows, they actually put the botanicals inside of their column, which isn't a standard place, but it's farther away from the heat. And he said, we got the best juniper extraction from putting it in the column itself. And so we unscrew our window and pack the botanicals into the column and actually get some really cool, um, basically, flavors at, that way. There's so much you can do. It's crazy. It is crazy. I think what we have on screen is actually, Aaron, you putting botanicals in? Is that what we're looking at right now? That's like, what we're looking at. Uh, that's exactly what I have the botanicals in. Um, so I, I have a, a offset gin basket where it, it, the angle is a little bit weird, but it's, I'm putting the botanicals in that column, and that column isn't even attached. It's not on top of my still. It's totally you know offset. From the still, um, and I, that's how I do. That's how I do my gin. As opposed to mine, which is zero botanical basket, and mine's a maceration style. So all my ingredients are going soaking in the spirit for basically 48 hours, being removed, and that's being loaded into the still. So my my botanical extraction is going to be 100% different. Man, and, 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 and it's we, in the butt cleaning process too. <laughs> It is a pain in the butt. We actually do a combination. So we macerate and then actually paper fast. So we do a little bit of both. So that's the cool thing is you can do so many different things with spirits. And, you know, we could all start with the same, you know, 12 ingredients and we would all end up with something different. And you can just share your recipe. I could give you my recipe exactly how I make it. You would never be able to make what I make. And that's a beautiful thing is because you have a different base spirit you're starting with, a different still, you know, different uh, equipment is going to create a different gene. Yeah, that's actually interesting you say that because when I got to a bigger still, I had to tinker with my formula again to try to match my flavor profile from the smaller still. And um, so it uh, still makes a big difference as well as the botanicals. That, and I, I would have never expected that. 
Yeah, I, I found the same thing. Um, Aaron, I really like this gym. I, I've had this for, man, how long have you been open now? It's been a little bit over two years. Awesome. Yeah, I remember my brother popped in there because he heard you guys open. This was like right when you opened, you brought me a bottle. And I was like blown away by the label. First of all, it's a beautiful package. And um, the gin itself is always just like reminded me of the time and place of when I got that. And I think you did a really good job of kind of like honing in that package of botanicals that where you could go a thousand different directions. You got to find your kind of your soul at the gin. And you really nailed that. Um, and it... It is a just a not overly herbaceous kind of like intense gin where I find that's kind of a flaw for me is when it's like so muddled with flavor that you can't really find the essence of it. And this is really well done and um, I, one I always come back to and drink often. So. Yeah. 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 And and that flavor, you know, the important thing too is with grape base, that, that base material, because that grape is so much thicker, if you do get too many botanicals, it can get muddled really fast because that grape has that, that mouth coating effect from the glycerol that, that we produce, um, I think, so well on grape based grapes. Yeah, which is what I love about, about you know, gins made from grapes is they, they have that, like, thicker, kind of silky mouthfeel, which I think is, is really cool. And, yeah. again, they're just even more unique to Central Coast. It, I don't know about you. It's funny. So I had so many people that come into the tasting room, and they go, oh, I don't drink gin. I had a bad gin experience. And... and they end up walking out with a bottle of gin, and, and it's funny. It's <laughs> And so um, it, it's amazing. I think as a craft movement, I think it's amazing how many people were turning back on to gin because it is it is great in cocktails. It does show kind of uh, the, the locality where you're picking it up from and the personal style. I, I, I get that a lot, too, and I, I, love, I love seeing that, especially when, I mean, yeah, one, you get them to try it, and then, like, two, it ends up, like, of all your things, it's okay, oh. Yeah, totally. That's really cool, you guys. Um, we're getting up near our time, but I, we have a couple questions uh, that I do want to get to. One is a consumer question uh, that I thought was uh, interesting is, is, do you guys find millennials to be kind of like legit long-term um, supporters, or are they just kind of, you know, looking for the next best thing? Yeah, I... I, I uh I don't know. I mean, we, I, I figured that my customer base would be more millennial skewed, but it's actually been, I, I'd probably say like the average age of my customer is probably like 50. Um, they're, 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 they're a little bit, a little bit older. Um, and I, I find that it's great because millennials don't have like this, this set brand loyalty. So they're very likely to come in and try your stuff, but again, they don't have set brand loyalty, so they're not going to be necessarily always coming back to it. But yeah, I I, I don't know. I've, uh, I've I've noticed I haven't really found a rule yet. I think we get a lot of traffic, you know, additional from the demographic that Aaron was talking about in the millennials that come through because they're really curious about craft produced products like that's what i think is the best thing about that millennial generation at this point is that they are curious they want to come and try stuff um they want to they're at the bar they're going to ask where was this made where can i what is local that's a beautiful thing the difficult part is are they bringing home a case definitely not they might get a bottle they pick up on this souvenir kind of style but it's harder to get the retention of like brand loyalty like they're going to keep coming back for that bottle they love um that'll I, only time will tell if that's the case, but I think we can tip our hat to the millennial generation just for being the most curious and asking the most questions about where is my stuff coming from? Is this local? How is it made? Are we? Do you guys think we're seeing any tourism uh, that is being kind of focused then on coming to the area specifically for this? As the this distillers association that you have going on. Uh, um, I mean, is that a focus? Is that trying to get people here? Because I know you, you think about like craft beer and, and some of the places like San Diego or Denver that people are like focused on and wanting to go to. Do you think we're, that's a direction we're going in? I, I think it's a direction we're going in, but I, 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 you know, I can't say we're not riding the coattails of the wine industry uh, quite a bit because that's what brings people to Paso Robles. But I think once you get to Paso Robles, I think the unique thing about our region is there's so much more to offer. And the, the distillery experiences, you know, we definitely get people that come in and say, we were just coming for the distilled spirits, but 
um, I would say 90% of the time, it's, it's people that came for the wine and stumbled across the spirits as well. Um, and, you know, the breweries as well. And now we have restaurants that are, you know, world class too. It's, so it's, it's the whole experience and the whole package that we, that we have here. And, um, and so I think we're, we're pretty fortunate to be where we are. And it gives, I think, our uh, regional distillers a real leg up um, because, you know, people are coming here for the wine and discovering us. Uh, where other parts of California, if you start a distillery in downtown LA, um, you know, you may have a big population base, but people aren't really coming there for that tasting experience. Sure. Absolutely. Um, another kind of interesting question uh, that this goes into some of the history of distilling, uh, and that is uh, being classified as proof versus a percentage. Um, what? Talk a little bit about the background on that one. You want to take it? I can take it. Yeah. I, I, I think like I, I've heard so many different stories on this, so I, I'll, I'll put out what I've heard. Maybe Alex or and Max have heard something different, but I think it's kind of a fun thing to I'll share what what we think the history is behind that. But uh, I, the, the story I've heard the most is that proof it was a it's an old school measurement that was based on uh, the equivalency of, of alcohol when it was burned and gunpowder when it was burned, and uh, now it's just kind of be arbitrarily become um, exactly 2x of what the alcohol percentage is. Yeah, well, that's what I've heard too. And it was a lot of it was based around like the Navy and, and the British Navy because they wanted proof that it was actually a certain percentage of alcohol. And so uh, at a certain point, the alcohol and the, uh, the gunpowder burned, um, and that was your proof that it was high enough for the, the Navy and you got paid. Yeah, people were watering down the spirit so much to, you know, get away with selling what they didn't have that people were tired of it. So you had to burn it in front of them to show that it, the proof that it had alcohol enough in it. But I, like creating their parents' I, liquor cabinet. Uh, when no, that's, I, 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 I did that once, I must admit. But it, it, the crazy thing is, is, and I'm sure you guys deal with this, this as well, but, you know, it's when you're doing all your paperwork, it's tough because, you know, you may have 2,000 gallons in a tank. But you don't report it as 2,000 gallons because it depends on what the proof is in the tank. Because everything we report is on a proof gallon, not on a liquid gallon. And sometimes you're just scratching your head doing your reports. We're going, wait, I got 2,000. No, I don't have 2,000 gallons in the tank. I have technically 3,000 proof gallons in that tank. And so at the end of the month, the reports just become chaotic. Right guys. All right. We are, we are getting it to the end here. And I'm sorry. I just don't want to keep people all that long, especially you guys. I know you're busy right now. Uh, but I thank you so much for joining me uh, to hang out and, and you know talk a little bit about spirits in the Paso Robles region. And so it's been a pleasure to get to know it a little bit more and talk to you guys. So thank you, Max. Thank you, Alex. And thank you, Aaron. I want to ask you guys, before we uh, end the call here, our little hangout, what's happening next? Do you have something new, something in the kettle, something, a new product? Maybe one of these is a, is a new launch. I'm, I'm going to start with Aaron. Aaron, tell us a little bit about what, what's next for you. Uh, for me, you know, it's, it's, it's a weird spirit, whiskey. You know, it's the only spirit to get people walking in. They're like, do you make whiskey? And I say, no, sorry, we don't. And people turn, turn around and walk away. So <laughs> it, it's weird. We're, we have whiskey coming out um, in the next few weeks here, though, which is really exciting. Um, and then I'm a huge rum nerd. I love rum. Um, I, I wish I'd gotten a chance to talk about it, but time was limited. Um, I love rum. I'm coming up with a bunch of different styles of rum, too. Right on. All right. Good to know. Uh, and so we'll, we'll make sure people, uh, you guys visit. You can go to our website, PasoWine.com, and you can actually find uh, these guys uh, under uh, one of the uh, other listings uh, as far as uh, other craft and, and um, um, specialty products. And so please go there, find them, or look them up. They, you've got them on the screen here. Refined Spirits, we've got Bethel Road Distillery, and we got Calwai Spirits Company. Uh, going to Max. Max, what's happening next with you guys? <clears throat> well, um, besides our age program, we'll probably, one of the big things we are working on, we have, we love gin, so we have our barrel aged gin, we have our house gin, um, but a release of more of the ter terroir style gin that would be kind of like along the lines of Aaron's Big Sur where you're pulling in some very like hyper-localized um, aspects of our region and highlighting them in a gym. That's one thing we've been developing and, and we want to pay homage to like the Paso Robles area and include some things that we grow um, from the botanical side here. And then one other thing that I love 
that has been a long time in the coming is an Amaro. Um, so more bitter than sweet, but something that is, you know, a replacement for your Campari and, but, you know, a little more depth and a little less sweet. So that's one that's coming down the pipeline for sure. Right on. Great. Thank you very much. Alex, we're wrapping it up with you. Yeah. No, so Amaro. Uh, Amaro or even a bitter type, uh, you know, uh, liqueur. Um, for me, we actually, we are working on a project. We uh, used a, a used Zin barrel, popped the head out of it, uh, zested uh, bitter oranges into the barrel, filled it up all the way, uh, put our uh, neutral base spirit in on top of it, the grape base spirit. And that is the base uh, for our uh, Amaro that we're eventually going to release. I always get nervous about saying things, though, because as soon as I tell something, somebody that something's coming out, that's all they can focus on, and that's all they want. But uh, we're actually going to be releasing a small sample of it, actually, this fall uh, for our bitters, because bitters are such a great um, uh, kind of addition to any cocktail. And so um, I'm looking forward to that uh, definitely coming out here soon. Very well, cool. like, uh, Miller, we just speak in years. We don't speak in you know, months. <laughs> yeah, but that consumer always like, when can I get it? <laughs> <laughs> right on. All right, you guys, this has been super fun. Thank you so much. Uh, everybody watching, uh, appreciate you being here. Go to PasoWine.com. This has been another episode of Exploring the Wine Glass. Thanks for listening. If you have any suggestions on what topics you would like me to discuss, please reach out on social media. You can find me on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook as Exploring the Wine Glass. I'm also on LinkedIn as Lori Hoytbud. Of course, you can always email me at exploringthewineglass at gmail.com. If you enjoyed our podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcast catcher to help others find me more easily. And of course, tell your wine-loving friends, because if you like the podcast, they will too. Until next week, sláinte!